It's Wednesday, July 29th, and my name is David Ewan, and I head up the Bravehearted Ministry here at the Resurrection Center with Pastors Jose and Melly Martinez. Welcome to our Bible session that is tonight. The topic tonight is Get It Right. And the reason why the topic is Get It Right is because that is what we're going to do today. Our scripture that we're going to be putting focus on tonight is 1st of Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 through 16. Now there's going to be a lot of things that I'll be talking about tonight but the first thing I'll be talking about is something called the great apostasy. Now that's a vocabulary word and sometimes we confuse it with the word heresy. So we're going to learn a little bit about some vocabulary. So tonight I'm in the mood of teaching. Pastor can I teach tonight? That's what we're going to do. We're going to be teaching tonight. The next thing we're going to talk about is being a good servant. That's why we're here. That's why I'm here, to be a good servant, because we want to be a good servant to the kingdom. And the last thing we're going to talk about, which we've talked about in the past, is to pay attention to ministry. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So let's get started. Let's get started. It's great to see everyone tonight. Again, my name is David Ewan, heading up to Bravehearted ministry. My agenda tonight will be, number one, there's six things that I'm going to be talking about tonight. Number one, we're going to talk about the great apostasy. And what that means is that's breaking away from Christian values and beliefs. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in detail in a little bit. The next thing that I'll talk about is how many will depart from their faith. You hear that in scripture. But you don't have to just hear that in scripture. Just look around you. It's in our homes. It's in our schools. It's in our jobs. Number three, we're going to talk about how we can know the spirit of doctrines of demons. Spirit of doctrines of demons. See, we have a faith, but the demons have a different kind of faith. But it's not the kind of faith that you and I are talking about. That's why we call it the doctrines of demons. So we'll we'll be educated on that. We'll talk about what that's all about. So this doctrines of demons that I'm talking about, it's in the news, and it's also in our household. We'll talk about our relationship with Christ that keeps our relationships together. Couples, for example. Your neighborhood, for example. And we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about what Apostle Paul was teaching Timothy for ministry. And the last thing we'll talk about is Christianity as a journey. See, if we knew what the destination was, there wouldn't be any Christianity. We wouldn't need to go any further. But see, we live in a faith where there is a journey that continues. And why does it continue? Because God has instructed us to move forward. That's why. So the focus tonight, and I'm going, I can't stress this enough. The focus tonight is God's glory is what shines from us. It's not us that shines. I'm going to share three testimonies tonight. In no way is it prideful, but it's to show God's glory. Because when you walk with the Lord, how do people see the Lord? They see the Lord in you. So that's what I'll do. I'll show you the Lord as the Lord has manifested himself through me so that I can share the testimony. That's what God is. We're going to talk about being attentive to healing and deliverance. And that deliverance is a very powerful word because that removes all sin from your life. We can never be perfect. It's only Jesus who is perfect. But we can go through a journey. We talked about that word journey of deliverance. So we'll talk about that. And what I'm going to focus on is the notion of repentance. I would enjoy talking about hope. I think I've heard enough messages of hope. I enjoy them. I think they're wonderful. My attention tonight will be one of repentance. Because we live in a day and age, and if you let me turn on CNN or Fox News, we live in a day and age where we need to be in a state of repentance. And then I'll talk to you about a message and also a testimony of seeking God's presence. 
bear with me, it'll be a very emotional night for myself. It's a very serious teaching. I, I pause teaching, because, but it's also a preaching because it's a testimony that's very emotional for me. So bear with me as I get through it. The first thing, as I promised, I would tell you about is, what is apostasy? What is that? What is apostasy? I'll tell you what it is. It's the abandonment or refusal of a religious political belief. So don't believe in that. See, apostasy in Christianity is the rejection, say to yourself, rejection, of Christianity by someone who formerly was a Christian. They were a Christian, and then they said, no more. The definition of an apostasy is the act of leaving behind or straying from religious or political beliefs or of your principles. That's the definition. Let me make it simple for you. An example of apostasy is when someone decides to become an atheist. So apostasy, atheist. Okay? Now let's, there's another word that we hear. We hear this word heresy. I just told you about apostasy. And sometimes when we study the Bible, we get a little confused. What's heresy? Or what's apostasy? Okay, so we just established apostasy is, is kind of like athe atheism. Is atheism. It isn't kind of like it is. Heresy is a departure from the unity of faith while believing. You still believe, but you, at the same time you depart from the faith. It is a denial or doubt of any defined doctrine. And what I mean by defined doctrine, I'm talking about Bible. Real, but like sitting down with the Bible and using not only reading the Bible, but using a Bible study guide and studying and understanding what it's supposed to be, learning about it at uh, the, the Sunday service, at a Wednesday Bible session. That's what I'm talking about. Let me give you an example of what heresy is. Homosexual Christians. That's a simple definition. False teachers in ministry. Yep, I said it. False teachers in ministry. So, apostasy, atheism. Uh, uh, heresy, homosexual Christians. So, apostasy is different. It's the deliberate abandonment of the Christian faith itself. So, let me give you an example of the scripture of apostasy. Okay? Now, tonight I told you we're going to be talking about... First of Timothy chapter 4. It's a very short chapter, 16 verses. I'll be reading it. Uh, but right now, I'm just going to read First of Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I'll just do that for a moment. So the scripture reads, The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and of devils. We talked about doctrines of devils, right? So let me break it down. Expressly means clearly, obviously. To depart means to apostatize. That's the verb of apostasy. We talked about that. Like atheism, right? Apostas apostasy is the deliberate and permanent rejection of Christianity after a previous profession of faith in it. When I say doctrines of devils, that is the doctrines taught by demons. You know, Salem, Massachusetts. First of Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1, which is now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So let's break it down to understand it more. There are at least three dangers, three dangers that lead us to commit apostasy. There are three of them. I'll tell you what they are. Number one, it's temptations. Number two, it's deceptions. Number three, it's persecution. Let's break it down. Number one is temptations. I got a different ice cream cone. Number one is temptations. Christians were tempted to engage in various vices that were part of their lives before they became Christians. Idolatry is an example. Sexual immorality is an example. 
Number two, deceptions. Let's talk about what deceptions are. See, Christians encounter various heresies. See, we talked about that word heresy. And false teachings spread by false teachers and prophets that threaten to seduce them away from their pure devotion to Christ. So those are people that are weak in their walk, that are easily seduced to go down the path of a wrong teaching. That's deception. If you know Bible, you are guarded against that deception. Number three, persecutions. Christians were persecuted by the governing powers of the day of their allegiance to Christ. Many Christians were threatened with certain death if they would not deny Christ. I was talking to someone, I don't know if you remember the fall of the USSR, and um, you have uh, the Commonwealth of Independent States like Ukraine and the others, and then you have Russia. Well, during the USSR, uh, Christianity was blocked. It was primarily Eastern Orthodox. So um, Christmas back in the day used to be like, we celebrate Christmas on the 25th. Well, during the time of the Soviet Union, now Christmas is, is not really Christmas, it's New Year's Day. So everything that you typically see in the traditional walk of life for Christmas, like the Christmas tree and gifts, well, they have the New Year's tree. And the New Year's is the big celebration with family. For us, it's Christmas. So we have already seen how they were persecuted in a way that they have been programmed in their minds that Christianity doesn't exist. The reason why I speak to you about this is I mentor um, a young man. Um, he's from the Ukraine. He's 18 years old. Uh, he's a prodigy. He's brilliant. Um, early graduate uh, from university, and he works in uh, all over the... He's like me. He works all over the, the world, but he's in the Ukraine. Um, but when I told him uh, about the, the resurrection center, because the question prompted up, I have to be careful about religion as a role as an ambassador, um, he said, what? A minister? I mean, he was just in shock that, you know, a person could have a job and also be a, a minister of the gospel. Um, and it, was, it, it just took me back because I actually witnessed it. We talk about persecution. We study it. But let me tell you, when you see it in front of you, it's like a slap in the face. So tonight, as I said, I'm going to be talking about First of Timothy chapter 4. But before I do that, I want to tell you the difference between chapter 4 and the verse 1 through 3 that we did. Okay? So First of Timothy chapter 4 is what we're talking about tonight. But what we did in chapters 1 through 3 is we emphasized personal matters relating to church and church worship and church operation and things like that. That was the letter that the Apostle Paul had initially sent out. Later, in the fourth, chapter 4, the primary topic are the dangers posed by false teachers. Because the people uh, of the day and of now of today, of the day and of today, are very weak in their walk. So they're very easily swayed. We have false teachers today, just like 2,000 years ago. So the primary topic is the dangers posed by false teachers and the specific responsibilities of various groups. Okay? So that's what we're going to talk about. Now, first of Timothy is in three parts. Okay? You, you notice I'm breaking this down because I want you to follow this. Okay, this is important to understand uh, what an apostle is talking to a church leader. We get an inside view of what our walk should be when we listen to an apostle speak to a church leader. Isn't it nice that we have the opportunity to have that in the Bible? Okay, so in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 16, that's a whole chapter, it's 16 verses. Number one, the great apostasy. We've been talking about that tonight. Okay, number two, being a good servant to Christ. I'm going to put great focus on that. Okay, sometimes when we seek the presence of the Lord, the reason why we're seeking the presence of the Lord is we're talking about being uh, a good servant of Christ. And by testimony tonight, 
is I was asking a question of the Lord five years ago. And the third item is to pay attention to ministry. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read all 16 verses. So that we may have reverence to the Lord. If you're physically able, please stand up, and I'm going to read 1 of Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 16. And the scripture reads, now this first part is the apostasy. So let's read this. And I've already read um, verse 1. I'm going to read it again. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. The next part is about being a good servant. Verse 6. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promised of the life that is now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. And then the last part is to pay attention to ministry. And that's starting at verse 12. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Dear Lord, I thank you for this scripture. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Please be seated. Thank you. So, again, I was just reading 1 of Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 16. We talked about the great apostasy. We talked about being a good servant of Jesus Christ, of the kingdom. And then we talked about paying attention to ministry. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to break it down. You ready? Let's break it down. 1 of Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 5, which is the great apostasy. As time goes on, some will depart from bi- biblical faith. We see that around us. Sometimes it's happened to us. They will pay attention to false teachers and false doctrine. That's because they're weak in their walk. Those who pay attention to these false teachers and doctrine will harden their own conscience and viewpoint as they turn against God and the apostles. Two prominent areas that they attack are marriage and food. Marriage and food. You look at what you see in shopping carts is atrocious sometimes. And I'm not saying yours. I'm saying if people. I'll, I'll tell you a true story. I'm almost embarrassed to tell you this, but I'm going to say this. My spiritual mother said say it, so tune in. She just said it. Here we go. Um, the heckling crowd over there. <laughs> God bless you. So my wife and I, when we're, we're, we're shopping, we're, we're we're shopping, and I remember one time I was shopping, and my wife and I, we were in the midst of a Daniel fast, not the recent one we just finished. Um, it was earlier this year. We've done three so far. So we were shopping, and we just mind our own business. We, we do not interfere with other people. So as we're w- going down the aisle, 
we see, we see someone coming with their cart coming this way. And what, it, what I saw were boxes of cereal, these sugar juices, these steaks, and all this unhealthy stuff. And I noticed the woman, let's imagine I, I'm the woman. She looks at her cart. She looks at, you just follow the eyes, right? She looks at the eyes, looks at her cart, looks at the eyes. And I have to be a good, I got to keep the straight face. <laughs> So anyways, this is something we saw. Um, in the second part, being a good servant of Jesus Christ, that's uh, 1 of Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. Timothy is to teach, warn, and promote godliness. You know what the most important thing was? Warn. Warn. Do you know why that's the most important thing? Because that's what people ignore. Warnings are ignored. Yes, yes. So he is to reject legendary myths because there's a lot of them. They are meaningless. Physical exercise is good. It's good to go to the gym, okay? But spiritual exercise is for godliness because that spiritual exercise that you get when you come to a Sunday service or, or a Wednesday Bible session or the other activities, working with your church family, that, that builds something that's lasting, for life and beyond, because it passes on through generations, okay? So Timothy should teach towards godliness. With godliness, one is focusing on the living God. Say living God. Who can say living God? Yes, good, good. Now, in the last part, where it relates to paying attention to ministry, in First of Timothy chapter 4, verse 12 through 16, the Apostle Paul encourages Timothy to be an example to believers. One of the best ways you can teach is to be an example. Um, um, so it, it was to be an example and also to continue with public ministry. The way he personally acts and what he does in public ministry are important. That's why we always hear the idiom, that phrase, actions speak louder than words. Why? Because it's true. Okay? So personally... Uh, he is to demonstrate good speech, conduct, love, faith, purity. See, in his ministry, he is to have a public reading of the scripture that was required to exhort, teach, use his spiritual gift, and stay strong and just be the example. Now, in the midst of all of this, we have the fire that attacks us. The fire that attacks us. And why do I call it the fire that attacks us? Because it hurts. It hurts, and it can damage, and it could damage for life. It's called the doctrines of demons, doctrines of demons. It's not soft, fluffy cotton. It's fire that's dangerous and can hurt. See, Scripture warns us of doctrines of demons. It warns us of that. Notice I said the word warns. Do you know why I use the word warns? Because we ignore it. We talked about that. The Apostle Paul says there are departures from the faith and it is related to the doctrines of demons. See, people listen to things. The doctrines of demons is sort of that tickle in the air. And when you hear it, you say, oh, I kind of like that. Okay? But when you listen to godliness and you have correction and you have righteousness, eh, I don't want to listen to that. And so that's why we have to be warned. Basically, demons want to depart from the true faith that God has revealed to us. And what has he revealed to us? He revealed to us that he's a true living God. And we're going to talk about how you see that. You know, when I talk about a true, I'm going to pause for a minute. I talk about a true living God. Now, a lot of people say, well, I see you, Dave, okay, and because you can see me, you can touch me. But with God, where is God? So the way you see God is how God operates in your life. And in that example, that example, when people say, wow, then people see God. Um, a few weeks ago, um, as we were talking about First of Timothy, I was talking about uh, our neighbor. Uh, my wife and I, we, we go off to, to church. We, we come here early. And uh, as we are getting in the car, uh, the grandmother of the owner of the house across the street from us, um, she said, oh, you look all dressed up. And, and I said, yep, going to church. 
And she just goes, wow. And she said, well, because she sees us do this every single Sunday. Um, so, but I'm, she's part of my testimony later on. Um, so, we're going to talk about some examples of doctrines and demons. Religious self-denial is one. Formalism, I'll explain what formalism is. You know what formalism is? Playing church. You go through the act. Departing from the faith. And then, of course, the false doctrine. I've been talking about that. So let me break it down. What do I mean by that? So here's religious self-denial. Demons would like people to engage in religious atheism. See? Apostasy, atheism, right? Or self-denial. A person can have false impression that they are pleasing God by this attitude of self-denial. The devil wants you to believe he does not exist. It's his best lie. And let me tell you, there's a lot of people that believe that. Number two, the formalism that I talked about. See, one of the things in which demons would like people to do is to be engaged is, is the mere religious formalism. See, the devil would love people to come to the church. You say, what, what, what do you mean? What do you mean the devil wants to see people come to the church? What, what does that mean? It means the devil wants people to come into church to play church, so to act it out, but not to have the Holy Spirit live within them. See, what the devil wants is to have no spiritual life to exist. Going through all the motions of religion without any of God's power is a demonic doctrine. So let me break it down. Playing church is a demonic doctrine. Playing church is a demonic doctrine. Playing church is a demonic doctrine. I'll give you a little fist bump there. Yes. Okay. And then the, number three. Departing from the faith. We see a lot of that. Departing from the faith. Rather than embracing faith that has been once and for all revealed to believers, demonic influence would have people either add or subtract what God has revealed in his word. Let's talk about that for a moment. Add or subtract from the gospel. Didn't the book of Revelation say if the Bible was changed, you'd be held accountable for that? Because the word is the word. What is another title for that word? It's a promise. You can't change God's promise. So that's false doctrine. This is what Paul warned Timothy about when he said people would depart from the faith. They would try to rewrite the Bible. Oh, what's the sequel? Um, number four, I've said it many times, false doctrine, false doctrine. The false doctrines that demons bring is the denial of, that Christ has come in the flesh, that Christ is real, that Christ is within us, that Christ lives within us, the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to talk more about false doctrine. False doctrine is that which opposes some fundamental truth of that which is necessary for salvation. See, false doctrine pulls you away from salvation. And I'll give you an example. Number one, the erasing of hell. See, a denial of hell directly contradicts Jesus' own words in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, and chapter 25, verse 46, and is therefore false doctrine. That's demonic. Number two, the belief that there are many paths to God. This false doctrine claims that since God is love, he will accept any religious effort as long as a practitioner is sincere. It also contradicts Jesus' direct words that he is the only way to God, as we see in John chapter 14 through 16. Six, I should say. John chapter 14 through 6. So that's why in my introduction I said I'm not going to talk about hope. I'm going to talk about repentance. Okay? Because I don't want... Repentance goes towards understanding who Jesus is and who, what our salvation is. If you don't understand that, then nothing else can be understood. And where the confusion can come to is, number three, it's redefine Jesus Christ. Doctrine that denies the de deity of Christ, the virgin birth that denies that, that denies his sinless nature, that denies his actual death, and his resurrection, that's a false doctrine. That's the elimination of Jesus. That's demonic. And I talked about number four, that Satan doesn't exist. False teachers 
The servants of Satan, that's what false teachers are, they're the servants of Satan, try to appear as servants of righteousness. That's because people don't know Bible. Okay? That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15. But they will be known by their fruits. That's in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. So number five, a false teacher promoting false doctrine will show signs of pride, greed, rebellion, and often promote or engage in sexual immorality. That's what happens in the church. Let's talk about the congregation. Let's talk about the people on the street, people like you and me. What are the personal reasons people leave church? Well, sometimes there isn't a guidance. There isn't any direction. Remember I said that what we need is to have repentance, and that repentance comes from the correction? That's what the fivefold ministry is about. That's what apostles are for. That's what pastors are for. That's what teachers are for, okay? And what happens is without that direction, without that light to see where you're going, you can fall off into the darkness. And this, there are some reasons why people do that. These are what I call personal reasons people leave church. Burnout. Burnout. These are people who come out of the gate too strong in the church. They show up. They get excited. They sign up for everything. They got so busy doing church, playing church, that they fail to enjoy being the church. Okay, so what's the idea? You don't do church. You are the church. Okay, let's do that. You don't do the church. You are the church. So that's burnout. That's why sometimes the doors of a church, it's, it's kind of like the ocean wave. You know, the ocean comes in. You see some pretty seashells. They look nice. Then the wave goes out, and they're gone. That's what happened. That's burnout. The next one is distractions. You see, these people got distracted by seemingly, I say seemingly, uh, good things. They're, they were playing in the world. They were loving the fast life. They were traveling every weekend. Over time, their lifestyle of, of attending becomes the habit of not attending. I'll say that again. The lifestyle of attending becomes a lifestyle of not attending. Excuses. Excuses. Another one is life change. These people had a lifestyle change such as a divorce or a remarriage, or they moved to a new community, and they never reconnected with the church. The big one. This is a big one. Mistakes. These people messed up in some way. They made a mistake that may be public, or at least they feel that it will be known, and the place that should dispense grace, the church, appears to either refuse it or they feel that it would. Many times when a person feels that way, it is more perception than reality. So they, they make a mistake, and then they feel as if, you know, I'll be rejected by the people in the church. I won't be accepted. And that's, that's demonic. That's in their head. That's a perception. I will say it again, Pastor. Pastor, ask me to say it again. Is, is that when a person makes a mistake in their life, Pastor, and they had been attending church, a mistake, life has twists and turns. And during the twists and turns, an event happens that may not be a big deal for another person or even to the pastor. But to them, it's traumatic. It's tragic. See, we're our own worst enemies, and it's in here. And by being our own worst enemy, we say, I'm not going to go to church because people will look at me. They'll stare at me. Do you? That's right. You don't have to worry about that. See, nobody noticed the pizza stain on my tie. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. No, no pizza stain. Oh, the heckling crowd over here. I had to say that because a while ago, I, I taught my wife how to make pizza. She makes wonderful pizza today. Um, 
So uh, the next one is a power struggle. You know, you see that in a leadership team. Pastor, can I be real? Can I be real, Pastor Melly? Okay, here's what happens. Is there's a power struggle. These people had an agenda. Say agenda. They were pursuing an issue or a position. And when their demands weren't met and they couldn't overpower the system, whoop, they're gone. That's what happens. And with that comes my next one, lack of connection. These are people who never really connected. They sort of came in, tried it out, sort of played church, but they never really connected. Um, and I don't know if that's their fault. I don't know if that's our fault as a church leadership team uh, or as a church body. I, I don't know what that, but sometimes that's what happens is, is people might come in and they just didn't connect and they leave, okay? But that happens. As a result, they never really felt part of the church. They just felt that there was a church, but they weren't part of it. But that's what we talked about before. Um, you, you don't want to do church. You want to be, ch- be the church because that's what the church is. It's the community, okay? So that brings me to my next topic. And I've been talking about this um, uh, over the past few weeks. What is ministry? What is ministry? You know, um, many of us have been in ministry for a long time. And and I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you a secret for those who would like to know. Um, It turns out that those that are in ministry are the ones that ask that question the most. What is ministry? (laughs) And there's a reason for that. Because... The elephant, the, the giganticness, if I could use that word, of ministry is so huge that w- just when you think you got it, not quite. So what is ministry? I'm going to be talking about, I, I, now I'm going to remind you what our topic is. We, we were talking about First of Timothy chapter 4. We were talking about the great apostasy, but I'm going to focus on the other two parts. Uh, the great apostasy, it's uh, being a good servant. So I'm going to talk about being a good servant and paying attention to ministry. Being a good servant and paying attention to ministry. Okay? Now, what is ministry? There are five things. Five things. Number one, it's overcoming challenges. I'm going to give an example of this. This is part of my testimony. Number two, it's being obedient to commitment. That's part of my testimony. Number three, expanding the kingdom. That's uh, part of my testimony. Uh, Fulfilling prophecy. That's part of my testimony. Being humble. That's part of my testimony. I'm going to say that again because as I read it again, think about this as the definition of ministry. Overcoming challenges, being obedient to commitment, expanding the kingdom, Fulfilling prophecy and being humble. See, I'm going to give you a testimony. Today, my personal story is not out of pride. It is a testimony to illustrate an example. Everyone's testimony is powerful because it is a story about how God moves in people's lives. That's how you see God. You see how God moves. Okay, that's how you know God is real. That's the manifestation. It's physical. You can see the action. Okay? It gives others an example of how God changes lives. That's what God's manifestation is. It's change. That's how you see God. If you don't see change, then you don't see God. That's because you don't have a walk. Okay? That's how you see change. And I'm going to talk about that in my testimony. So, again, I I want to stress, this personal story is not out of pride. It is not out of pride. I thank God for using me for his glory. My, my testimony is not about hope. It's about repentance, okay? And it involves a new way of thinking. And at this moment, I'm going to ask me, Kushita Linda, my beautiful wife, to join me at the altar. And you can't hear it on, on camera, but she goes, oh, oh, yes. My wife is saying to herself, it worked better in rehearsal. No, we didn't talk about this. She didn't know she was doing that. So, honey, I'm going to have you stand over here so people can see you. 
Okay. See, I'm holding the lollipop that Minister Wayne gave me. So I'm going to have uh, you hold this. Okay. And hold it so that uh, they can see it. Um, as I said, I'm not a prideful person. This is an international award I, I received last month. I'm not a person that talks about awards. As a matter of fact, I've actually won three. This is just one, okay? So do you see how it's the pretty? Do you see it says pretty? It has all the degrees and certifications. It's 23 letters for my tw uh, title, 22 letters for all the degrees and certifications. I, and it's more letters than the alphabet. It's uh, for global communication and leadership. It's from the Token Enterprise International, all of Asia, the Middle East, Europe, Russia, Latin America. That's the pretty part. You know what the pretty part is? That's the part people are jealous of. But that's not my point. That's not the important part. The important part is this. What do you see? The back. This is the glory, this is the story. What is the story, the sacrifice? See, the way this started, it started in 2015. What was happening in 2015, as I told you before, I was seeking God's presence. Now, some of you have been with this uh, church, the Resurrection Center, located here at 1060 Worcester Street in Springfield, Massachusetts, the Indian Orchard area of Springfield. Um, and um, the, the church started in the year 2012. There are different dates that we choose. It could be January 28th when it was incorporated. It could be February 12th when the pastors were um, ordained as pastors. Okay, But it was the beginning of 2012. During 2012, or before then, it was in 2011, my wife and I met the pastors. And I'm going to make a long story short. Long story short, pastor says, we're putting together a church. So I worked uh, as a lawyer and as an accountant and did all the stuff that happens behind the scenes. It's not a small task, um, but it was a big task. In that two th year of 2012, um, the day before Thanksgiving, In 2012, the day before Thanksgiving, my wife's father passed away unexpectedly. The day before Thanksgiving at 3.30 p.m. That was a tough year. We're still working on putting the church together. In 2013, a year later, the day before Thanksgiving, yet again, our nephew was in a car accident. The girl that was in the car died, yet again, the day before Thanksgiving. One year later, um, or during the summer, we had a great um, family reunion at my parents' house. It was on July 26. Yes, I remember the date, July 26. On August 26, 30 days later, I heard my mother had cancer. And then September 26th, she was gone. That was tw that 2014. And in 2015, my father died, one after another. So yes, after four years, yes, I was seeking God's presence. And I was asking a lot of questions. So that's where I was in 2015, after that. That's when I became a United States ambassador, an ambassador professor. See, the Apostle Paul was hol holding Timothy accountable because God holds us accountable. The award taught me this. It took five years to figure it out after those first initial years that I first told you. See, it started in the short year between my parents' death from September of one year to October of the following year. From 2014 into 2015, that is when um, this started, this journey started as an ambassador. That's the first one. Overcome tragedy. Overcome challenges. That's ministry. In January 17th of 2015, 
We were led by the Holy Spirit, my wife and I, after what we had just gone through with the loss of my mother and that my father was sick, um, to renew our vows. We had communion. This was at the other building. This is before we purchased this building. That's obedient to commitment. That's ministry. Number three, working on financing for a new building. It started, this building started in 2015. The pastors are witness to that. We were just talking about it the other day, what that was like. It was not easy. That happened in 2015. That's expanding the kingdom, making this building happen. That's ministry. Apostle Lourdes, in 2015, was on the altar, and Marie and I, we were in the back. We're leaders. We're doing, following instructors. The pastor tells us to do something. We do it. She walked from the altar and walked immediately back and said that you're going to be talking to presidents and kings and industry leaders and government leaders. She said that. She prophesied that. That's in 2015. That happened. That's fulfilling prophecy. That's ministry. I don't ask me, ask people to call me Ambassador Professor. Dave. That's who I am. I'm Dave. I'm part of the church family. Nobody calls me Ambassador. I call people by, by honor and respect. Pastor, minister, pastor. But I don't ask for title. I'm humble. That's ministry. Overcoming challenges is ministry. Obedient commitment to commitment, that's ministry. Expanding the kingdom, that's ministry. Fulfilling prof prophecy, that's ministry. Being humble, that's ministry. So you go from this to this. And that's why I shared that with people. Because that represents not pride, that represents ministry. Thank you, honey. So this is what the Apostle Paul was talking about, overcoming challenges, being obedient to commitment, expanding the kingdom, fulfilling prophecy, and being humble. That's why that means so much to me. See, that's how you seek the kingdom of God. It's a testimony of repentance because with that, what I just told you, with what happened in 2012 and the tragedies that happen every fall for four years and then the journey that started with from 2015 onwards, that requires change. That's repentance. That's moving forward. I thank God for using me for his glory. See, God holds us accountable for our actions because God requires us to use him for his glory, not our glory. Because if we use it for our glory, that's pride. God uses people to plant seeds. It's all God. All success comes from foundation. In the ambassadorship, we say we do four things. Discipleship. Yep, I say discipleship. Because what's discipleship? It's uh, design, develop, deliver. Design, develop, deliver. And that's what evangelism is. You deliver it. Everyone's testimony is powerful because it is a story about how God moves in people's lives. It shows the manifestations of God's plan because that's God's plan. That story I just told you, that's God's plan. That shows that that's what God wants people to see. It gives others an example of how God changes lives. When that happens, you get favoritism, and you get provision. You get your favor and provision from the Lord. So I, th I think my wife told a couple of people this, but I'll, sh I'll share with those who haven't heard. Um, on Sunday, this past Sunday, it was a typical day. Uh, what I mean by a typical day is usually my wife and I, we get to church early. We get here a half an hour before the leaders so that we're ready for the pastors. We're ready for the leaders. We're here at 1030. And we're, we're setting up the atmosphere. We have the flags going. 
and uh, we're, we're, we're making sure the monitors work, the lights work, everything works. We're here with Minister Wayne. We're getting everything going. Okay, that requires focus, attention to get things ready so that when you come in, everything looks easy, okay? Um, and then when we finish church uh, service, then Marie and I and Minister Wayne, we have administrative things to do, and then we go home. When we go home, I get out of the car, and Maria noticed I seemed to be pulled somewhere, and I was walking towards her car. Now, we live in a, a very quiet street. It's a wide street, and we park our cars in front of the house, so we're parked in front of the house. And I noticed that her rear uh, left corner was smashed into by a car. It was a little disenchanted, I'll admit. It was a little, I wasn't angry. I was a little disenchanted. How could that happen? Just saying. So if you look at her car, directly across the street, there's an Airbnb. It's a business. It's an Airbnb. And the owner of the Airbnb is the house next door. Now, I'll say up front, uh, my neighbor and I, we get along very great. Uh, and, and the business she runs, wonderful. So I talked to her. And, and the reason why I'm sharing this with you, again, I'm, I'm showing you how God manifests favor and provision. So um, well, I talked to her, and she says, she pulls out her cell phone, and she says, well, we got the video right here. Oh, so video. And, um, and said, oh, you got, well, you got a security camera. And uh, Maria asked like three times, where's the camera? She said, oh, it's over there. And I, I, I couldn't see the camera, but the camera saw you. So what happened, what happened was she showed on her phone the, her customer uh, backing out, and she sent it to me. I'm using that for, for the claim, so I'm, I'm, I'm covered. Um, she showed that on Saturday night, so the day before going to church, on Saturday night at 11.03 p.m., there was the black Volvo that backed out of the driveway, hit my wife's car, and then left. I mean, it was fast. It was like this. I'll act it out. I mean, I, I, as I see this, my, Maria asked me, why am I laughing? I can just imagine. They take a swig of some beverage. <laughs> then, then they're backing out. Check this out. They're backing out of the driveway. They hit my, my wife's car and go, boom. Forget about it. <laughs> and just drive off. <laughs> That's what it was. So, and I said, Let me, can you play that again? And we kept playing it over and over again. It was a fast video. You hear it? And you can hear the crash. And, and I'm saying, this is a security camera over there. And way over there is the crash. And you can hear the crashing. So what we call it now, the sound of the crash, is the forget about it moment. <laughs> so, um, so but, but the interesting thing is, now we, we look at this. When we were getting ready for church, and we had to be here at a certain time, had I seen that, then I would have been distracted. I would have been delayed. Could I have really done anything with the car? Not on a Sunday morning. But I would, and if I, you know, eventually when I do come, pastor would look at me sternly and say, what's bothering you? <laughs> well, well, in the car, you know, fuck out of water. <laughs> you know, and then he said, Dave, take a seat. But that didn't happen. Everything was, was a very powerful, pastor, you had a very powerful service on Sunday as he will again this Sunday, but everything was very strong. So God protected us with that. Then when we got home, we met with the Airbnb owner. We saw that. Now, remember I told you my wife was saying, where's the camera over there? And you know what she said? Oh, I just installed that Friday. The crash happened Saturday. She just installed the camera. Is God good? Is God good? Yeah. And one of the things, uh, as we finish up our meeting with the owner of the Airbnb, God bless her, she said, thank you, Jesus. Um, 
Another favorite provision, um, and, uh, this is just brief. Um, I found out officially yesterday, and I didn't know this before, but uh, one brother of mine and one sister of mine um, are recovering, but they got hit with COVID-19 very, very hard, and they survived. And I just found that. So that's my forget about it story and also my other two testimonies. So what I've talked about today is the focus on the scripture. We talked about we talked about first of Timothy chapter one, uh, chapter four, I should say, verse one through sixteen. We talked about the great apostasy. We talked about being a good servant of Jesus Christ. We talked about paying attention to ministry. We talked about the testimony that was focused on number three, which is paying attention to ministry. We went and talked about that a lot. And it's not out of pride. I thank God for using me for, for his glory. Um, today, we talked about the great apostasy, breaking away from Christians, uh, uh, Christian belief, values and belief. What we also talked about is how many will depart from their faith. We see that now. We also talked about how the spirits of doctrines and demons, it's in the news. It's in the household. We see it everywhere. We talked about our relationships with Christ keeps your relationships together. We talked about what the Apostle Paul was teaching for ministry. We talked about Christianity is a journey. It's not something that ends. And our focus today was that God's glory is what shines from us. It's not us that shines. It's God's glory that shines. We talked about the attentiveness to healing and deliverance. We talked about repentance rather than a message of hope. And I don't want to tickle your ears. I want to talk to you about repentance. And I'll do that by way of teaching it. I'll do it by way of giving a testimony. And we talked about the message of seeking God's presence. If there's nothing else, it's to seek God's presence. You know, tonight was a, a night of teaching. Um, there's a website. It's owned by the Resurrection Center. It's called the, K, uh, the kradio.com. It's, so it's T-H-E. Kradio.com. There's a reason why I'm telling you about uh, one of our radio station websites. Of course, we have Resurrection Center Radio.com that you know. But at the Kradio.com, there's a button there that says Bible 101. So if you want to study the Bible, we have summaries. It's a total of six hours, 66 books in six hours. That's where it is. So it's the Kradio. Dot com. Of course, here at the Resurrection Center, if you're watching this, you already know that on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, we're at TRC413. And for those watching us on um, YouTube, we, you know that it's Res Send Spring. That's our channel. We also have www.resurrectionspringfield.org. And we also have our address at 1060 Worcester Street, in Springfield, Massachusetts. My name is David Ewan, and I head up the Bravehearted Ministry here at the Resurrection Center. I thank you for coming. I bless you. I thank you for being attentive. I have been blessed with your attentiveness, so I thank you for that. I ask that you take what you've learned tonight and you bring it with you. It's also been recorded, so you have that as, as well. I bless you all. My name is David Ewan, and this is the Resurrection Center.